Oh, careful, careful. Wh what is it? Well, there's a, there's a spider. Don't get bit. Oh, okay. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. In this video, we're talking about starting your own garden for this year. There's a lot of renewed interest in gardening for many reasons at the moment, you know, from it being difficult to go to grocery stores and people are concerned about virus contamination on their food to just being unsure about the reliability of the supply chain of food, you know, if things are always going to be available in the grocery store. So there's a lot of people that are interested in starting their own gardens. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Now, first off, I'd let you know I'm not an expert gardener. I've been gardening for many years, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm a work in progress and I'm always learning. And I think that's oftentimes what most people need isn't so much somebody that's an expert in all things, but someone that's been there before, done things, had some trial, had some error, and can point people in the right direction. In addition to that fact, experts can never be as much of an expert as you have the potential of being for your very specific microclimate around your home or wherever you're going to be doing your growing. For example, you could have one street and at one end of the street there's a certain set of growing conditions and it could be different at the other end of the street. Maybe the soil soil's moister or drier at one end of the street or the other. The way the trees are growing in different people's yards, maybe the sunlight hits one person's plot really early in the morning and, and just down the street, the way that the trees are, it might take until like, you know, almost afternoon before there's any sun hitting that area. So everybody has your own uh, very specific kind of microclimate and you have the potential for being an expert about that specific space. And the best way to do that is to just jump in through trial and error and learn because one of the great things about gardening is it really doesn't cost that much money to do it. Now, it's completely possible to spend an awful lot of money gardening. I'm, there are lots of companies that have created a business model on the idea that they are willing to take your money and give you stuff, but so much of that stuff you really don't need. What it comes down to is soil, water, seeds, and sun and many of those things are free. So let's talk about those things. Let's start with seeds. I think that's the thing that most people get excited about. Like what should you grow in your very specific area? And that is a question that is specific to your area. And the best way to uh, get an answer to that isn't from someone like me, but it's from someone at your local garden center. Garden centers very infrequently are gonna be selling seeds that don't grow well in your area. So if you go down to your garden center, I know right now we're in the middle of a coronavirus outbreak, wear a mask, do what you need to do, but get down there and talk to someone and ask them, what are some easy things to grow in my area? And I wanna caution you about the word easy. Uh, there are a lot of rumors that go through the growing and gardening community about like, well, this plant is easy and this plant is difficult, but you know, it really comes down to individual experience. For example, a lot of people will say that African violets, now it's not a food crop, but it's you know something people grow in their homes sometimes. A lot of people say African violets, oh, they're so temperamental, they're so difficult, it's so difficult to grow African violets. My mother, has African violets all over her house and she just says they're the easiest things in the world. She just waters them occasionally, occasionally forgets to water them. And for her, they've been really easy. So it's important not to listen to those kind of rumors and just try stuff because generally speaking, this stuff doesn't cost that much money to try. I would advise you to consider uh, getting heirloom seeds versus the hybrid seeds because oftentimes there's multiple options. You can get hybrid tomatoes or heirloom tomatoes. You can get hybrid pumpkins or heirloom pumpkins. The advantage of hybrids is that they are they're really good at growing oftentimes. They will give you a huge bounty, but the downside of them, which is the upside of heirlooms, is the downside of hybrids is the seeds that you get from those hybrid plants. If you collect those seeds out of that hybrid pumpkin, there is no guarantee at all that they are going to be A, viable, or if they do grow something, it may not have the same characteristics of that hybrid uh, variety of pumpkin that you're starting with. An heirloom seed, on the other hand, uh, generation after generation, as long as they're not cross-pollinating and you're creating hybrids with other uh, plants in your garden, and things like pumpkins can cross-pollinate with squash, so you want to kind of keep them separate uh, as much as you have the ability to do so. Uh, but uh, generation after generation, as long as they're not cross-pollinating, they're going to be continuing to give you the same types of seeds. So if you have a pumpkin that you like, the seeds that come out of that pumpkin will be able to grow that same kind of pumpkin for the following year. So I would uh, advise you, if that's something that's of interest to you, if you don't want to be reliant on always having to buy new seeds every year, get heirloom seeds and they're going to reliably give you the same type of crop year in and year out. Again, provided that you're not cross-pollinating and creating your own hybrids in your garden. The second thing you need to consider is where you're going to grow this. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have a lawn, uh, you know, there is 
a lot of real estate there for digging up. Uh, you, and you don't have to take up your entire lawn. You don't have to like clear out like you know a 10 by 12 foot area where it just rip up all the, the grass and it's just dirt. You can uh, you know make little holes like you can make like an eight inch in diameter hole in the in your lawn. Just dig that up and plant a, you know, say a tomato plant there or a pumpkin plant there or whatever. And it can kind of you know, grow out across the grass. It doesn't need to be all dirt if you don't want to rip up everything. But you have a lot of options there about how you do it. You can also grow things in containers. You can grow things uh, you know, on your porch. You can grow things in your windowsill. There's all sorts of ways of doing it, but you really need to get a source of dirt. Now, if you have a lawn, you have an obvious source of dirt. The dirt's right there in the ground. You may want to improve that. You probably want to improve that uh, that soil and there's a lot of different ways of doing that you can go to a garden center many of them uh, will uh, supply compost that you can mix into that soil uh, or you can make your own compost now many people can and do make whole videos on how to do compost the, the, the perfect way to do compost the best way to do compost you know the best uh, products that you need to buy to, to create compost well I'm gonna give you a, a secret that I've developed over my lifetime and it is the easiest way to make compost and also the most effective and the way that you do it is you take your food scraps and you put them on the ground. That's it. You don't have to turn it. You don't have to do anything. You just make a pile of your food scraps. Now, the downsides of that is, you know, if you have local animals, they might want to investigate your compost pile. Now, I had a, a terrifying uh, experience with this several years ago where uh, our compost pile was right outside of the bedroom, bedroom window, and I was woken up horrified to see a family of baby raccoons. I are just dying on your arms tonight you know, nibbling at the compost pile. So if you want to avoid a nightmare scenario like that, about, you know, seeing little baby raccoons come up and, you know, poke through your uh, compost pile, you know, you can buy one of these drums and you can do all that kind of stuff. But the benefits of throwing it on the ground is one, you don't have to buy anything. Two, it's really easy. You can't miss the, you know, the hole in your, your compost or whatever, because it's just, you throw it right there on the ground. Um, and also it prevents your compost from getting like overly saturated with water. That's one thing, you know, there's like balances. You want so much carbon material, so much nitrogen material, and you can get all into what that is, but nitrogen materials, the dry or brown stuff, and the carbon material is the wetter, greener kind of stuff. Uh, but if you have too much of the carbon rich stuff, it can make your, uh, your composter get uh, too much water in it. It can get uh, anaerobic and start smelling and everything. Uh, if you're just throwing the stuff on the ground, all that excess moisture just goes right into the ground. It's not a problem at all. Uh, so it really just throwing stuff on the ground, nature, finds a way and it'll compost the stuff for you. Now, is that the absolute fastest way of doing it? No, I, you know, you can you know, keep rotating them and get them up to a certain temperature and do all that kind of stuff. But, you know, hands down for ease and effectiveness, throw the stuff on the ground. It also gives easy access for worms to come right up out of the soil and do the work that they need to do in there and everything. Throw stuff on the ground, it'll compost, and it'll be ready for you next year. For this year, you're gonna to wanna to bring in some soil. You can buy compost, buy some type, type of garden soil out of bags if that's the way you need to do it. Any way you gotta do it is the way that you should approach it because, you know, it doesn't really cost that much and you're improving your, your lawn and its ability to sustain life. Now, at the end of the season, when you're harvesting things, uh, I would suggest uh, collecting a lot of your seeds. These are some seeds, uh, bean seeds, that I collected from the 2017 season. Now, a lot of people will tell you, I'm recording this video in 2020, they'd say, oh, well, 2020, uh, 2017 seeds, those will be no good, you know. And yes, the germination rate of seeds goes down the older that they are, but if you keep seeds in kind of a cool, dark place uh, and they, they're kept dry and, you know, they're not, uh, you know, it, you know, going to mold up or anything like that. They're going to be good for several years. And, you know, if they're not, worst case scenario, you try them and they didn't grow. You really don't have anything to lose. The last thing that I would suggest that you might want to do is get some kind of a, uh, you know, a book or a guide uh, that would just give you a point in the right direction if you'd like to try anything new. This is one that I use all the time. It's called Crockett's Victory Garden. It's based on an old PBS television station that was aired out of Boston, which is convenient for me because I'm in New England. Boston is also in New England. So we have kind of a similar kind of growing environment. So I find this book helpful, you know, for your own specific, uh, you know, climate or biome or whatever, you might want a different book. But one of the things I love about this book is it breaks it down by month. So it will tell you in April what you should be planting in these kind of seed trays, what you should be put to planting directly into your garden, what you should be transplanting from a seed tray. Uh, it, it kind of breaks up the whole year for you and it makes it, uh, makes it kind of uh, easy to sort of, you know, follow the directions and kind of stay in sync with things in a way where you kind of have a schedule uh, for yourself. Now I reference these seed trays and they're right in front of me and I wanted to talk 
a little bit about these. These are great and one of the best things about these is that it just uh, gives you an opportunity to start so much stuff and it's always a great problem to have to have too many seedlings and not enough places to put them because then you're like tucking little plants all over the place like under your porch or not directly under your porch but in the corner of your porch let's have a pumpkin kind of go along there or by the mailbox you can grow some crops or whatever. So I think it's great to buy a lot of these kind of seed starters and you know just it, have big big dreams at the beginning and like you know what do you waste a couple dollars on a few seeds that maybe you don't find a home for or you can give it away to your neighbors and you know they might be very happy to take in your orphan plants and you know they'll remember you when you know they they're having that that crop uh it, when you are putting these things into the uh, seed containers though what i would recommend is that you make a chart a map so you know what all these different things are you see you know many of these plants have kind of a different look to them these real tall ones here and these are a little taller than they should be i haven't been giving enough light to this uh, uh this setup there's really small windows in this house and uh, i i don't like using grow lamps guy like saving electricity and stuff so these are a little more spindly than you'd really like to see them but anyway these tall ones you can see these are kind of different from these and there's uh some really tiny ones over here uh now i, I know that these are all kind of squashes and these shorter ones are onions i this might be broccoli, I'm not sure. The point is, it's a good idea to make a chart for yourself so you can remember later on what all these different things are because when you're planting them, you don't want to plant something low and then have something that's going to grow really tall right in front of it and it's going to be blocking the sun. So you want to kind of have a sense of what you're growing and use that uh, information to determine where you're going to be putting it. One other thing that I would note is when you're uh, planting these, it's handy to leave one of the cells open. You can leave it open in the corner and that does two things. One, you can note on your chart which is the open cell and that will remind you like which the, uh, orientation these things have because if you take a seed tray and you rotate it 180 degrees, suddenly you're like, like is this the way that I had laid it out or did I laid it out this way? That way, if you have the open cell, you know the orientation. So you know, okay, open cells in the lower right-hand corner or wherever you happen to put it. And the other uh, benefit of it is it's an easy way of watering the whole tray. You, can, you don't really want to water these from the top. You want to water them from below. And you can pour the water into the empty cell and it'll uh, disseminate underneath all of those guys. So that's just a ha handy pro tip from someone that's not a pro. But the biggest tip that I can give you is just go out and try it trial and error doesn't cost you very much and you're going to learn so much about gardening and especially gardening in your very specific climate and you'll become an expert in how to garden in your yard. That's it. Thanks for watching and good luck. This episode is brought to you in part by Burning Hearth Homestead, a nonprofit that aims to provide seeds, live plants, and education to the community both local and extended. Plant seeds, plant knowledge, plant the future. If you'd like to thank them for supporting this channel or find out more about what they do, go to burninghearthhomestead.org. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.